Boom. It's being recorded. Mike Lindstrom from Phoenix, Arizona. 118 degrees today, my man. Uh, I, I don't know how I survived the heat. I'm a bald guy. I can't hide the sweat. That is what it is. You know, I fell in love too long ago and uh, had to move out here from San Diego, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. But before I was in San Diego, I was from Modesto. Motown. 209, baby. I wanted to wear this shirt for you, Johnny. So uh, I'm really excited about this today, guys. You know, as you guys know, uh, people who listen to me or see me on social media, especially during COVID times, I, you know, I've, I haven't been able to travel. I've been, I've been on live stages and do what I normally do. So I've turned my office here in Phoenix into a studio, got the fancy mic like by Casey Kasem. And I'm, I just bring my friends in. I bring my clients in and I just highlight success. And John and I have been friends from childhood. I'm dating all the way back to uh, elementary school. And we'll tell uh, some stories here in a minute about each other. But what really what got my attention um, was, was two things. Number one was a statistic I read uh, a couple of months ago during COVID times that the average American get, had gained 21 pounds. Uh, I, I can tell you myself, my gym was shut down. I had gained weight, uh, lost weight, got back down to my normal kind of, I'm not at fighting weight, but I'm almost there. But I get it. You know, you're eating out, you're trying to support the local restaurants, which which, which was a story that we told ourselves because we want to make ourselves feel better, right, during difficult times. Um, so that coupled with some uh, posts that I saw John uh, post about his weight loss journey. Um, and I already know from doing business coaching the last 22 years that two of the toughest things that people overcome, have to face or overcome, um, extreme weight loss and addiction, very tough things. And they're very similar if you think about it. So, John, I just want to say thanks, bro, for coming on and uh, joining me today. I, can't, I don't even recognize you, man. You look so different, man. I feel different, man. I feel great. I'm, I'm literally in the best shape of my life, man. So I'm excited to be here with you and I'm excited to just tell the story, you know, and, you know, cause it, it has been a lifelong journey yeah. and I'm not done yet, man, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of it. You know, um, somebody the other day posted on Instagram, that he was, he was lifting weights and he said, you know, climbing the hill with no climbing the mountain with no peak. And um, I really feel that way, you know, and, you know, we're just building the castle one brick at a time, one rep at a time. And, you know, just taking it day by day, man. Yeah. Just, just trying, just trying to be the best version of myself. So I'm excited to be here. So one, thank of, my, you. one of my favorite phrases, you just said it. And I've always believed that when you are the best version of yourself and everybody knows in their heart, what that is. No one else can define that for you. Not your parents, not your siblings, not your spouse. It's yourself. You'd be able to look yourself in the mirror and go, am I being the best version of myself today? Yes or no. And if the answer is no, then you look at yourself and say, well, what has to change? That's a right. big thing. So obviously we'll hit that today. Cause I know you've had to look yourself in the mirror and ask that question and something did happen for you, but let's take it way back. Let's go way back, man. So I got to ask you a question and, I, and I'll answer the same back to you. So do you remember your earliest memory of you and I, like when we were children, like kids? Real quick, yeah, real quick. like it was yesterday, man. Okay, so I got to take it back to Babe Ruth baseball, seventh grade. Okay. You, you had a reputation for throwing gas. I mean, just, you know, just being virtually unhittable. And everybody was scared of you, you know? And I remember we were playing at Downey and I got the batter's box and when you cocked your arm back, I closed my eyes as tight as I could and I swung the bat, crack. And I opened my eyes and the ball was like to the fence. And it was like little league where the, the little kid hits the ball and doesn't run. Bro, I was frozen at the plate cause I couldn't believe I hit it. And everybody like, everybody's yelling at me, run, run. And I, I should have gotten at least a double out of that hit, but I got a single, but, but, you know, so that's my earliest childhood memory of us interacting. Um, but really the one that really, really, really sticks to me is after we played, you know, uh, eighth grade football against each other. And I spent the night at your house because we lived on, you know, we lived in different parts of town, you yep. know? And so, I spent the night at your house and you showed me your telescoping pointer and your monogram briefcase. <laughs> and I went, this dude has it going on. You know what I mean? And, th and even then, even then I knew Mike Lindstrom will be successful. He will have a life of success because, you know, call it, call it manifesting, call it a vision board. You know, you already were putting the tools in place and you even said, you know, you said, yeah, when I'm in social studies, I like to go up to the board with my pointer and go right there. Like you were using it. 
So you were already implementing the tools as a leader, public pu speaking publicly, and just being that guy, you know, who's carrying a, who carries a briefcase to eighth grade? Mike Lindstrom. Oh man. And by the way, I still have that briefcase. Uh, Beautiful. It's I, going in the Smithsonian someday. I, I appreciate that, man. I, I forgot that story, but I, I do remember carrying a briefcase all the way until college. Uh, and I got that from Michael J. Fox and Family Ties. There's actually, yeah, there's an episode and he's teaching his little, the, the, the younger son, the kid, Michael J. Fox is talking to him. And he said, successful people carry briefcases. And that's all it took. I took, I told my dad, my dad took me, you're going to laugh at this one, John, Montgomery Wards. Remember Montgomery Wards on McHenry Avenue? Absolutely. Montgomery Wards. And I got like a $29, I don't even know, it's like a Samsung, whatever, a Samsung, Samsung. Uh, Samsonite. Samsonite, Samsonite. And uh, that was my first briefcase. Still have it to this day, man. So I appreciate that. Well, I'll tell you, one of my one of my favorite stories, uh, it's not my earliest one, but I, I got to bring up the fences. The fences is a great story, right? So what we were walking around back in the day in junior high school, you know, we'd walk around to the movie theaters. And I actually talked to a couple of friends that were, were witness to this to try to verify this. And uh, there was this one particular area we were trying to walk over to the movie theaters on McHenry Avenue. And we kind of knew how to get through the fences, but you had to climb one fence to get over it to get through this one spot as a shortcut. And uh, we're all jumping the fence and John's standing there. And again, this is part of his story, man. He's a little bit overweight guy, right? And we're all athletic guys just flipping over the fences like something out of, uh, you know, the, the Outsiders, the movie, like Patrick Swayze, just jumping over the fence. And John just stands there with his hands in his pockets. And he goes, hey, man, I don't do fences, man. I don't do fences. And, and, and I remember that moment because I'm thinking, is it because he can't do the fences or is he just choose not to do fences? He wants to walk the route. So I'll be damned, man. You walk the whole damn route, like 100 yards extra to go around the fence because you don't do fences. So I thought I was kind of nifty when I saw your weight loss, uh, you know, pictures. I had to joke with you on Instagram and say, hey, man, can you do fences now? And I'm sure you're doing more than fences, buddy, because you're doing burpees like a madman every day. So one of my favorite stories, bro, and I always tell it. Yeah, man. And you know, it's interesting that whole, I don't do fences. Um, because really that was a facade for, I can't do fences. You know what I mean? So by, by putting not a chip on my shoulder, but the whole forest, you know, it had you second guessing. Well, you know, why, why, why it doesn't matter. I just don't do it, you yeah. know? And, you know, and so now, yeah, I'm not doing fences, but I I'm sure as hell breaking them down. I love you know, and, and I think that, you know, we'll get into this, I'm sure, but it's, it's shedding that I can't, or mm -hmm. I won't mm -hmm. narrative or that skin, you know, and, and now it's like, oh, hell yeah, there yeah. isn't a fence high enough. We're yeah. going over, it. we're going through it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I had to start there. I mean, so we have a lot of friends. I know this is kind of like the year of our, I guess will be our 30th high school reunion. I mean, COVID kind of set things back a little bit. So uh, we, we're not sure what's going to happen with that or not, but I've seen a lot of stuff on social media, people putting then, you know, then and now pictures or before and after pictures, you know, from high school to now. And, you know, I, of course I had to share your picture that you shared with me from back then to now. And we got a lot of love on uh, Facebook and Instagram from the pictures, but it's incredible. But I, I got to ask you, man, I know this is a, this is a tough topic and I, and I want to make sure that uh, that I honor the, the the toughness of this topic. It's not just you know John and I cutting up as friends and and being funny. This this it's not funny what we're talking about. It's serious stuff. This is life threatening type stuff. But I want you to take me back a little bit if you don't mind, and and I'll let you. There's no script here, guys. By the way, all my friends know this. I don't script things. I just give people an idea of what I'm going to go to. Can you take me back a little bit to like childhood? If you have any early memories around weight or or things that are what I always call indelibly etched in your brain that you'll never forget. Can you give us like one or two key things real quick and how that kind of shaped maybe your belief or mindset around weight and your identity? Yeah. I mean, look, you know, it's, I mean, man, there, there are so many, right? Because what you're basically asking me to is, you know, recall every moment of my childhood, really. I mean, because you walk around with it every day, you know, and you know, nobody wants to be the fat kid. You mm -hmm. know, it sucks being the fat kid. It's difficult being the fat kid because, you know, I mean, even when, you know, in grammar school or elementary school curriculum, when, you know, nutrition is part of, of the curriculum and you're talking about different food groups and things, the word fat is part of the equation. Even as like, you know, 
nutritional facts, you know, right. certain percentages of fat. Every time the word is uttered, like 35 kids in the room looking at you, it's tough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I had a crush on a particular girl in sixth grade and it, she found out about it. And she told the person that told her, tell him that I would never go out with a boy that had bigger boobs than me. Wow. And that, that one stung. And I'm sure yeah. that's probably not what she said. She probably said some more expletive words around that. Maybe, but, but the message was very clear. And, you know, I mean, to this day, even though I've lost, you know, a hundred pounds, you know, I'm still self-conscious about my body, you know, and, and I still, you know, have concerns and body image issues about going anywhere outside of my home without a shirt on yeah. a beach, a pool or what have you, you know? Um, so I'm working on that, you know, I mean, you know, that's one, um, you know, um, I was playing a skins and shirts soccer game when I was a kid and, um, our team was skins and I was playing goalie and I've said, you know, goalies always wear shirts. And they said, no, you're part of the skins team. You have to, you have to, you know, wear, you know, you have to go without a shirt, you know, and, you know, I got heckled horribly you know you know in relationship to that you know yeah. and and having having boy boobs not man boobs because i was a kid yeah you know and then you know i mean like i like i had said before you know um you know my parents were war babies you know and came from a, a very poverty stricken backgrounds on both sides and so we had i grew up in a house where we ate everything on our plate and you're not getting up until you, you clean your plate yeah. You know, or here, here's one more helping, you know, because we don't want to let it go to waste or we don't want to have to deal with putting it in the fridge or whatever here, just, you know, one extra, you know, my grandmother always went one scoop beyond, you know, um, that's good. And then one more for good measure, you know? And so, you know, it, to this day at age 48, I'm still trying to reestablish my relationship with food, you know, in terms of like stopping when I'm full leaving those last few bites on the plate, you know, you know, so you're talking about like some serious yeah. psychological hardwiring that goes back as far back as I can remember, really. Yeah. I think the, the interesting part to me when we were talking about this in preparation is that the, we're, the, we're not really taught at, at a young age. And, it, you know, I have two sons. They're, Brett's going to be 13 here in a month, be a teenager, which is crazy. Time flies. And my other guy's 10. And, and Rhett's a big boy like I was. I was an early sprouter, early, early puberty kid. He's following my same track. He's like 5'8 at 12 already. He's just a monster. I mean, sure, he'll be taller than me, but eventually he'll hit his spot maybe early on like I did. Hopefully not. But I, I, I do the best I can to like talk to him about just educating him. Hey, that's protein. That's fat. That's carbohydrates, right? But we were never taught that stuff, bro. I mean, it's the stuff that, you, like you said, I mean, if, if it was served up on the plate at dinner, I remember my dad, Skip, you know, Skip, man, Skip was like, Hey man, if you're not finishing your, your, your food, you ain't getting up from the table. I remember my son, my brother, Justin didn't like beets. And he sat, he sat there from eight o'clock at night till midnight, staring at those beets on the plate because my dad was so adamant that you're going to clean your plate. So I, I think the educational part of it, I think is so important. I mean, what have you seen that shifted? I mean, you're a dad. I mean, how do you, how do you go from that paradigm of what we went to in the seventies and eighties to what's going on now? Well, a couple of things. And by the way, my you're not getting up from the table story involves pig brain and scrambled eggs. <laughs> 8 a.m. on a Sunday till nine o'clock at night. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, they tried to pass it off as scrambled eggs and um, it, it was not- Oh, that's hilarious. It was not fun. Yeah. That's so funny. Oh, not funny in real time. Not, it I know, I bet. Brutal, I bet. Man, it's, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's that indelibly etched thing I talk about. It's a memory you'll never forget. I, and my sister said, you think you're smart, huh? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, you're getting smarter every bite because you're eating brains. I dropped the fork on the plate, pushed the plate away. I said, I was eating brains. And then my parents were like, no, no, you were eating it before you found out what it was. Because I was like, these eggs taste funny, right? Wow. Till nine o'clock at night, man. It, on that hard oak wood chair, it wasn't, wasn't fun. So, you know, the difference between you know, then and now is first of all, I have to give props to my amazing wife, Mitzi, who yep. is, is one of the attendees here. Yeah. 
Um, thanks for tuning in, hon. Um, she has always, you know, she's a professional dancer. And so she's really, really up on nutrition and, and kinesiology and, you know, it has, you know, amazing, amazingly good consumption habits has always led by example, regardless of how far I've strayed off of my consumption. Yep. She's always been just very diligently consistent yeah. in her, in, in her consumption you know, and we made a decision a long time ago that we weren't going to do that to our kids, that we were not going to make our kids or force our kids to eat anything they didn't want to, or, you know, because that's how people develop eating disorders, yes, you know? Time. So, you know, I have, I have to all, you know, I'm not alone in this, you know, I have an amazing partner who is, who is my rock and who really, really is, is a wonderful support, but also like, you know, the brains of the operation in a lot of ways of just, you know, checking things in real time. Yeah. We always encourage our children to try something and we give mad props when they do, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, um, nobody's going to be chained to a chair for the day because they're not eating grilled onions or whatever it is. So beats or brains, that's like a book title beats and brains, beats and brains. <laughs> My, my poor brother and you, man, that's, I never had that situation. I honestly, you know, I, I, I was, my dad always told me something interesting as a young man, when I was in my late uh, mid twenties, he said, you know, Mike, I, I was okay if you feared me your whole life until we got to be friends. I was okay with that. And you know what? It worked. I'm not saying that strategy works, you know, spanking and, you know, whatever, you know, parents do back in the day, the day versus now, but you're right though, man. You can't force, I mean, especially kids now, man, they got cell phones. They can Google something in a heartbeat. They know what's in something. They're going to make different kinds of choices that you and I didn't have. We were just told, Hey, why do I have to eat this? Because I said so. Because, because I said it's good so. for you. Yeah. It's or good it's for good for you. Right. So that belief system, that's a big thing I teach John is belief drive behaviors. So when you have a behavior, like you have to clean your plate, that's a behavior. Yeah. You have to have second helpings. That's a behavior. When you have to eat certain types of food because that's what you like, because it's good for you, allegedly, that's a behavior. Well, where'd that belief come from? And that's what I want, I, hopefully people get from today is to maybe question themselves a little bit and say, hey, what do I believe about food? Why do I eat? Do I eat, you said this last night, for fun or do I eat for fuel? And I want you to articulate that a little better because I, I had never heard that juxtaposition so maybe that belief when that shifted in your brain or when you know you and mitzi were chatting about that what what tell, tell us about that that's that's a different mindset you know, this whole fun versus fuel yeah i mean when you think when you think about it like i mean i was thinking about this earlier today in terms of prepping for this this discussion with you is think about like post friday night football where do, you know or post even Pop Warner football, everybody went to the pizza parlor. Yep. Right. We're gonna go. We're gonna go out. We're gonna go out to pizza. We're gonna go celebrate. Right. Birthdays. We're going out to dinner. We're gonna have cake. Yep. Right. You know, baptismals, first communions. I mean, you know, cake, cake, cake. Let them eat cake. Right. Yeah. And you know, not, there's nothing wrong with cake. I mean. I'll, sure. I'll enjoy a little sliver of cake every now and then. But when you think about our relationship with food, right? We eat because we're happy. We eat because we're sad. We eat because we're bored. We eat because, um, you know, it's just mindless consumption. Think about going to a movie theater mm -hmm. and you get a bucket of popcorn that's the size of a freaking like oil refinery, you know, and yeah. you're just, you're just, you know, wide eyed looking at a screen, just shoveling. Yeah. You know, with butter and salt. I mean, it's, it's, it's mindless consumption. So we eat, you know, for every other reason than for fuel, which right. is what, you know, consumption is intended for. Because I think that, you know, this is where we get, get into nature versus nurture, right? I mean, you know, one of my master's degrees is in cultural anthropology. Right. So I had to study human evolution as part of my, you know, master's program. And, you know, I don't think when we were in hunting and gathering nomadic bands, right, the paleos, mm -hmm. essentially, yeah. right, that people were going, hey, we're eating these berries for fun. 
No, we're eating berries because we're trying to survive. Right. You know, we're eating protein to survive. We're not eating, you know, a, a woolly mammoth carcass because, you know, it's, you know, individual Y in the group's birthday. Yeah. You know, there's no concept of that. It was yeah. all to survive and, you know, for the good of the group and for human evolution. We've yeah. gotten so far away from that because as soon as we became sedentary in terms of the development of civilization, then we amassed surplus. And then you had control of resources, right? Class systems developed mm -hmm. and then somebody controlling those resources. Right. So, you know, it's all systemic in how it moves about and permeates through various cultures. But man, think about this. This is, this is where I break it down. Cause I'm a car guy. I love cars. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I know. Building my sixth low rider right now. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, and the last thing I would ever do is pour a bag of sugar in the gas tank that would destroy the vehicle yeah right so why would we do that because this is our gas tank that we need to survive right so i'm i'm embracing this whole notion of eating cleaner and it is paying big dividends in terms of how i feel right. how i'm sleeping how i'm able to exercise right and learning like the science and the mechanics of all of it it's awesome, man. Yeah. And that is all contributing to me being in the best shape of my life, man. For you, know, you know what's funny or ironic or not? You know, I don't believe in the uh, randomness. The, the universe works in funny ways. And there's always a reason. But I happen to see, uh, think, you know, Facebook always feeds me a year ago today, five years ago, your memories, right? So it was a year ago today on this mic, literally in this office, that I had a doctor, Dr. David Dahimi on here talking about how to protect your immune system because COVID was like rampant you know, a year ago, you guys know this. And one of the seven elements they talked about was two, two all hit sleep and hydration. Simple, right? You know, you got to hydrate. I mean, your body's made up of water the world's made up of water. Well, you know that, um, but sleep. And I, and that was something that re was really profound to me. We got a lot of feedbacks after that. We did this webinar on the sleep element, because a lot of people have that belief of like, Oh, sleep's BS. You can sleep when you die and all that stuff. But the, that educational piece that he did, Last year, just on the sleep, that five minute segment woke people up. I mean, literally in a way that's like, holy crap, I never thought I need seven to eight hours. So that belief shift influenced a lot of people. And that's my hope today. When people hear you say that, John, think of a fuel tank. Right? You would, no one would go put sugar in, no one would do that. I mean, it's stupid, but, but we do it to ourselves. So if, if you just take that one belief shift and say, hey, I got to be more mindful of every single thing that crosses my lips and what the impact is going to be, not just on my energy, my body, the, the negative things, the cancers, the things that we, you know, we're going to expose ourselves to. But mindset, you know this, brother. I mean, come on. How, how much is your mindset opened up because of your weight loss, not, not your, fuel, your, fuel, you know, your fueling, not funning, right, with your food? How much has it changed your mindset? Just period. 100% because, you know, I really have to be mindful about how I consume, right? I mean, I had weight loss surgery two years ago, right? And, um, and I was on the program, I was doing everything that they told me, you know, because they told us, you know, in the consultation meetings prior, they said, if you don't, if you do not stick to the program, you will gain the weight back. I have cousins who have had weight loss surgery, who gained the weight back. I have a friend in Brazil, who had who had, um, weight loss surgery and he is fatter today than he was before he wow. had his surgery wow. because you know you don't follow the program right and so i was i backslid big time you know so what happened was with me is i was i discovered ice hockey by accident really you know i played roller hockey when we were in junior high you know and um and then whatever i got away from it you know, just interest change, what have you. But um, we took we took our kids and our niece ice skating January of 20. And I got hooked, man. I loved everything about being on the ice. I loved the way the ice felt under the blades. I loved the temperature. I loved the vibe, the coolness, the, you know, the cold air on my face. I just literally just got hooked. Yeah. I didn't say anything. 
I went to the hockey store. I said, give me the best pair of hockey skates you can give me for 200 bucks, got fitted up, enrolled in ice skating lessons. And I said, I'm going to play hockey. Right. Wow. So I was, I was hitting the ice, like sometimes twice a day, every weekend I was all in S dropped an enormous amount of money on hockey gear enrolled in hockey school because I wanted to play goalie. Right. So the weight was, I hired a private goalie coach. The weight was dropping off. So at the shutdown, I was at 165, right? Oh, wow. So I'm, I was stoked. I'm like, man, this is it. I have found it. Eureka. We're, we're good. I'm just going to play hockey and that will be my weight management strategy. Okay. Well, COVID hits, we're shut down, working from home. And I took for granted how much I moved around campus at work, teaching community college. I'd get an yeah. email, you know, if, uh, marketing had a question for me. I would grab my cup of coffee and said, I don't want to email back and forth for 45 minutes. I'll just run up there real quick. We'll have a two second conversation and it's done. And then, you know, I'll take the stairs. I'll come down the stairs. I'll stop by the study abroad office to talk about the trip I'm planning with students. And then I run into somebody, oh, come to my office real quick because I have to give you your book back. So I'm zigzagging all over the campus all day, putting in steps, man. So that with the hockey, I was feeling great. I was doing great. COVID hits, we're shut down and we're sedentary now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the scale starts to creep up. The holidays come and I just literally said, caution to the wind. I'm going to eat whatever I want. It's the holidays. And I watched that scale creep up and up and up and up. Wow. So I got to like 184 from 165 to 184 to 184. And today my weigh in is 165.4. Wow. So for the last two months, I've been working out like crazy. I've been hitting the burpees. I've gotten back into the boxing gym. You know, I'm just like, like, and you know, and then more importantly, tracking my food, yeah. watching my macronutrients, watching my fats, watching my carbs, watching my proteins and working my behind off. And so, and I'm seeing the results, man. So losing the weight is only one step in the process. It's managing it. That's the real battle. Yeah. Yeah. I, you're right though. Cause there's so many different, there's medicines out there, you know, that you can take that will get you to drop us, drop the weight quickly, but it doesn't change the mindset, man. You can't eat. That's such, like you said, hard wiring from the time you're, you know, a child up until now, you can't just go take that, uh, you know, that, the, what that shot that what's HCG or whatever they do that the, the, or the surgeries even, right. You, you go do that temporary fix. That's great. It helps you out, but you have to, you have to sustain. And I think that's true with anything, John, I, I teach us in goal setting. That's one thing to go do something for a, a seven day period or a 21 day period or 30 days and change a habit. Right. Or you could put 10,000 hours. And as, as they say, you know, to create new habits, to create mastery, but you have to you have to have checking mechanisms in place, accountability, right? You have a partner that holds you accountable. You're 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 a dad. Um, your lifestyle, accountability. But if you don't have those kind of checking mechanisms, it's easy for the average person. You would agree, I assume, to that to people fall back. Whether it's the holidays or oh man, it's Fourth of July. Um, we're gonna barbecue and drink beer, and I'll start on July eighth. I mean, that's a mindset that's common with most people, don't you think? I think so. I mean, it certainly was for me. I mean, I can only really speak for myself. You know, for me, like I'll give you an example. The other day I was at a birthday party and they busted out a tiramisu cake. And I went, wow, that looks really good in my mind. Oh, that looks really good. And they asked me if I wanted some. And I said, I want that much. I want that much. Yeah. Yeah. And they literally cut it about as wide as the knife blade. I took a couple bites and tried it and I was good. You know, every now and then, because my oldest son drinks soda like crazy and it's a concern for me. And, we, sure. and my wife and I remind him, Hey man, diabetes runs on both sides of our family. Just be, he has what we call a Bruce Lee body. Oh, he, he is ripped, man. Yeah. He, metabolism off the, he has his mom's metabolism ripped mike ripped and i told him hey man just because you're skinny doesn't mean that 
you're immune to diabetes. So you have to watch the soda. We're always on them about it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But every now and then I'll ask him for a little sip off of his soda. So I can be reminded about how repulsive it tastes. Yeah. It is so, so I can't stand it. Yeah. I absolutely cannot stand it. Right. This is, this is coffee with ice in it, you know? And um, so, so yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I live my life for today. And number one, there are no silver bullets. I was in Costco the other day and it was like, I came across this display for um, fat burning tablets. And I posted in my story, they were, they were like $24.99. And I was like, burpees are free. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And there are no silver bullets, man. There are no silver bullets. You can have the surgery. I had the surgery and yeah. I watched myself start to gain the weight back because I fell off. Mm -hmm. You know, you can take um what was that um there what was that one weight loss supplement that was like super popular basically had meth in it um, oh um you know that, what you're talking about that gnc they would sell yeah, it yeah you know and you can take it that's fine but there's no guarantees you right. know uh, you know it's 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 <laughs> it's not even necessarily a lifestyle change it's a mindset change mm -hmm. that's for me what it is because the, 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 where the head decks a trim. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Where the, where the head goes, the body follows. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, nobody starts walking, putting their foot forward. Your body has to have that momentum, but it's the head that is leading the body. Yep. Everything starts right here. Uh, that's huge, man. That's huge. So tell me a little bit about the, the surgery. I mean, I, I only know this because I researched it after you told me about it, but I think a lot of people out there that might be exploring options. I mean, it's, there's no shame in it, man. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of science. I've always said that I don't care what it is, whether it's a medicine or a, a procedure, it's not shortcutting in my mind. There's people who have genetic prop propensities or otherwise. Can you tell us a little bit about what the procedure really is? And then what, what do you have to do as a result of it? Like, how does it change your life or your lifestyle? Okay. So the procedure that I had done was, um, was basic. It's called a VSG, right? So it's, it's a sleeve, it's a sleeve surgery. So what they do is they remove 80% of your stomach and they sleeve it. So they basically, it goes like, you know, I'm not an anatomy major, but basically sure. they cut out the big part of your stomach and they just streamline everything. Right. So your stomach becomes about the size of a, you know, small banana okay. right into the intestine. Got right? it. So, they, so they remove 80% of it. your stomach. And by default, that forces portion control, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, how I even got to the surgery was I used to have a doctor who had, you know, he was known to over medicate every, his solution was just more meds, more meds, more meds. And my wife was like, you know, you're taking a lot of meds, you know? And as you know, as anybody knows that you know you take a lot of medication that's going to alter your moods yep right so i was on like a cocktail of medication and he even su he suggested years years prior to me having the surgery that i have it and i was completely offended like this quack how dare he right like i got all like you know i got all ruffled about it how dare he suggest that i have weight loss surgery can you believe no. can you believe that you know and so I had switched doctors and the doctor that I have now, um, I have a ton of respect for her. And, um, and I was kind of complaining about this guy. And I said, you know, can you believe he, that he went so far as to recommend weight loss surgery? Yeah. And she looked at me dead in the face and said, well, John, to tell you the truth, you're the ideal candidate for the surgery. Wow. Now, now this is coming from the perspective of somebody who I respect. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, talk to me about that. And she said, look, we have it well documented that you tried this naturally because I tried Weight Watchers. Right. You know, I would, I would go in and out of, of gyms, you know, yeah. all the testing, all the blood work, all the EKGs, all the stress cardio, you know, and my weight yo yo, like it, like if I showed you my Fitbit app, you know, wow. for my weight loss, it just goes, like down and then back up higher to what it was. I mean, it literally just zigzags, right? So 
so I said, okay, I'm listening. So she started to give me more information. I, you know, I talked to, you know, Mike, our friend, Mike Pitts, who, yep. who had weight loss surgery. I started talking to different people that I knew had surgery. Um, but I sat on it, you know, I wasn't quite sure about it. And then I had some blood work done and I had been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, okay. which is not, which is nonsense. I sure. mean, once they start you on metformin, you're a diabetic, right. You know, um, you're just not that diabetic. Right. right, right. And, and so um, when I got those numbers, I said to my doctor, I said, so this basically means I'm a diabetic. And she said, yes, you, you have full blown diabetes at this point. And like I told you last night at that point, the hammer was cocked. Yeah. Now I'm staring down the barrel of a death sentence. It's just right. a matter of when mm -hmm. that was my wake up call. That was my wake up call. So I started to go through you know, it's a whole battery of, of testing. You know, I had to meet, I had to do like extensive lab work. I had to meet with the surgeon. I had to go to orientation meetings and this was all done through Stanford university. Yeah. Um, I had to meet with a psychologist. I had to meet with a nutritionist. Um, and the only thing left on my checklist pre-op was, um, you know, they had to go down, they had to put a scope and endoscopy. So they put a scope down my esophagus to check the stomach and make sure yeah. that the stomach was all good. And that was the missing, that was the last thing I had to do. So I went to Brazil um, and my friend down there, a different friend, um, he used to be really, really big and he lost a ton of weight. I said, how are you doing it? He said, I've spent four hours a week in the boxing gym and I cut carbs. I came home and I told my wife, I said, you know what? I'm going to hold off and I'm going to, I'm going to just wait and yeah. I'm going to try to do it naturally. And she said, you know what, hun, whatever you want to do, I support you, which has been her mantra for yeah. nearly 25 years that we've been together. Yeah. Whatever you want to do, I support you, you know? And, um, you know, although all throughout you know, my medical, my weight yo-yoing and my, my, you know, eating a cocktail of pills, yeah. she would always come back with what's it going to take, John, yeah. what's it going to take for you to get your shit together? Right. What's it going to take? And what it took was me getting the full blown diabetic diagnosis is what it took. So I came back from Brazil and I had that talk with her. Nothing changed, man. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I was still eating like crap, not exercising. It was all just still denial pipe dream stuff. And then um, New Year's Day, I was up early. Um, we were in Long Beach at my, at my mother-in-law's house and I was just having a cup of coffee by myself. And I went, you know what? Stop it. Stop it. You have to do this. Otherwise you're going to die. Mm-hmm. You're going to die, you know, and, you know, something was wrong when a, four, a man in his 40s is comparing prescription medication with his mother-in-law in her 60s. Like, that's, that's not right. And I just went, you are in your 40s and you have the health of an unhealthy senior citizen. Yeah. Come on, man. Wow. So I decided, I said, you know what? I said, I'm all in. I'm doing yeah. the surgery. I'm doing the surgery. So that was uh, New Year's Day. That was New Year's Day, what, 2019? Wow. And then I had my surgery like March 13th of that same year. Yeah, that's crazy, man. We talk about the ongoing maintenance of doing this. You know, after you have the procedure, you have to maintain, right? We talk about that, but that that's the physical part. It tells you, hey, here's how much you should eat. You know, keep track of your macros. Macros means you're like your proteins, your fats, your carbs. Measure what comes in, garbage in, garbage out, the whole philosophy. I get that. But the mindset about purpose and why, which I talk a lot about in my coaching, purpose and why. So here you are, 2021, it's June, we're staring down summer, everything, the landscape of life is what I call it. The kids are older, you're older, you're matured. You have this new body, this new identity, really. But what's the purpose and the why for you that keeps you going? Where you, I mean, we all have our days, man, where you, you, know, you wake up on a Saturday at six o'clock and you're like, ah, snooze button, I, I don't wanna go to the gym this morning. Like what's your driving force? I'm chasing how I feel. I'm chasing how I feel this morning. Okay. I'll, this is a great question. I'll tell you why. So this morning, this morning I woke up with a stuffy nose Okay. and I freaked out. I've got to talk with Mike today. I'm stuffy. I can't oh, like, 
you know, and I posted in my Instagram post, you know, this morning that I almost let a drop of water become a mental tsunami. You know, I started talking myself 50 different ways as to why I should not exercise today. And I just went, you know, and a lot of it was based on what I did yesterday. And I went, you know what? That's what you did yesterday. What the hell are you going to do today? Right. Make it about today. You know what I mean? So, you know, really it's envisioning the person that I want to be working to become that person, the best version of myself so that I can give myself the self-care and the self-love so that in turn, I can be a better partner, a better father, you know, a better, you know, professor, a better member of society, you know, and, and, um, you know, just be more productive because, you know, the, the exercise, you know, it's holistic. I think that really at age 48, I'm finally figuring out how to live my best life in the most healthy way. And it's, you know, my wife, my wife was laughing at me the other day. She said, cause we're getting ready to go on vacation for it's our wedding anniversary on the 27th. Sure. And um, we're going to San Diego. And I said, you know, we really need to make a concerted effort to eat healthy. She started laughing and I said, oh, so now I'm funny. She said, no, it's like talking to a different person because she's always been an advocate of eating healthy. And I would scoff yeah. at it like, yeah, I don't want to eat no salad. Give me the, right. give me the super burrito and a pizza on the side and just gluttony where she's always been like, you know, you know, salad, you know, watch the ranch dressing and, you know, yep. like, you know, you know, get me a burrito with no sour cream, no cheese, yep. you know, black beans, like really health conscious. And I'm like, caution to the wind. Let's get down. Right. You only live once. Right. So you might as well enjoy it. Right. Well, you might cut that extremely short with the gluttony. You know what I'm saying? So I think that that's my why and my purpose is I love how I feel. I'm in the best shape of my life. And I want to keep chasing that, man. I want to keep chasing that. That's great. And and then that that permeates into every other aspect of my life. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, this concept of the younger generation, I know you and I are the same age, but, you know, take someone 35 and younger, this whole concept of YOLO, right? You only live once. F it, drink it, do it, party it, whatever. And look, we've all had our moments in our life. We've all been there. I get it. Yep, but if yep. you can get that that new mindset of, and I, that's just what I teach my clients, B-V-O-Y, best version of yourself. That's the new YOLO, man. It's the best version of yourself. It's not, YOLO means just do what the hell you want and without with any, any care or concern about other people in your own body because you only live once. But if you take the concept of best version of yourself and you got every decision, like, when you wake up, when you go to bed, who you hang around, right? I mean, you know this. I mean, you are who you hang around. You're the the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I mean, you to look at the, the five people you spend the most time with, just look at their character, look at their personalities. You're right in the middle of that, right? So being the best version of yourself is not just being a leader for your family as a father, like myself and yourself, but the people around you. You're a professor, man. You're teaching young people. You, you walk out to teach a lecture, the first day, I know you know this, man. People are judging you. They're like, who is this guy? We read his ratings, but they're looking at the presentation. Is he is he a big guy? Is he fit? Is he small? Is he smart? Do you speak intelligently? I use the word congruent. Congruent means walk your talk, talk your walk. Do the yeah. shapes match? You and I learned this in geometry back in sophomore year, right? When the two shapes match, identity and behavior, people are going to respect you because they believe what you have to say. And that's why I think it's so important for people that know you and that's why I was I really pumped to share this with friends on Facebook and our friends from 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 you know high school and friends uh, friends from our hometown Modesto because I know for a fact they may not raise their hand John but people are struggling out there bro people are struggling with different things people in their life they've lost people whether it's addiction drugs alcohol food I mean it's all in the same bucket it's it's a mental battle that we have with ourselves it's just fill in the blank everyone's got their own thing but if you can yeah. come on like this and just be real and authentic with it. I think it's so compelling. It's so inspiring for people to see like, holy crap. Like look at John looks amazing back from high school to what he looks like now. So I know, you know, that you're inspiring people, man. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this. We're not here to sell anything or pitch anything. It's to tell a story, to tell the yeah. story of how someone became sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. So I want you to, I want you to, I want you to speak on a couple of things before we start wrapping. I want to get some questions. Um, tips 
tips. Now we all know eat less, you know, you burn more than you take in. I mean, there's some fundamental things about weight loss, but if you had to say there were some fundamental things that have helped you day in, day out to maintain, what would be some tips you would share with people? I would say, you know, think about why you're eating. Okay. Think about what you're eating. You know, I mean, cause man, I have this vision of my, of the not best version of myself. Cause look, man, I quit drinking seven years ago and my, you know, I put alcohol down, but I was quick to supersize, you know what I mean? And what's interesting about, about the documentary supersize me is on the back end, like medically, he was punishing his liver as though he had been drinking heavily that whole time, wow. you know? So we're just, you know, you know, you're filling your body with toxins, number one. So I was thinking about, I got sent to a conference in Chicago and, you know, I had all these ideas about things I wanted to do in Chicago, right? I need to eat deep dish pizza. All right. I want to go see some Chicago blues. I want to do this. I want to do that. All of the after hours stuff that take advantage of being in Chicago. But I was so spent after the day of seminars and talking to people, I go to the gift shop, buy a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, go to my room and just sit there and eat every, like for four nights, right? a pint of Ben and you know, how many of us have that story about eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream or whatever, you know, the Ben and Jerry's is or whatever that represents oh, absolutely. Six, six pack of beer, you know, pint of pint of booze, whatever. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, an entire pizza, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right. But when I think about that, I'm like, man, I could never imagine myself doing that now because I would hate the way I would feel the next day. Right. I would already anticipate like now when my check is thinking about how badly I'm going to feel tomorrow if I eat this. Right. Because you notice once you start eating clean. Right. And don't get me wrong. I'm not like pounding the pulpit like a dogmatic vegan. I'm no. not doing that. All oh, I'm okay. saying is I have figured out what works for me. Right. And it was it was past my way from other people that it works for. You know what I'm saying? So when I figured out how to eat clean, you know, eating badly, it just doesn't compute. You know, we went to the river last weekend and, you know, my wife bought stuff to make s'mores. That stuff is in the pantry. I've been looking past Hershey bars in the butter compartment of my fridge for a week. And it never occurred to me once to eat it. I'm like, you know what sounds good right now? Cup of blueberries because they're delicious and I'm getting the antioxidants. So I'm figuring out other ways to get that sweet craving. You know what I'm saying? I do. But all like, but all I need to track the macros because I need to see where I'm at. Yeah. Can I afford this? Can I afford a handful of granola right now? Oh, no, nope, too much fat. It's going to mess up my pie graph. I need to look for another option. Yeah. So I would say, you know, ask yourself, why are you eating? You know, what are you doing? You know, are you, because the other thing too, that I taught, I was taught in my bariatric process was that, you know, oftentimes when we think we're hungry, we're really dehydrated. So the fact that I've been working out like crazy, That's right. I'm also like checking my water intake as well, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a whole, a whole host of things, but I would say that, you know, it's, you know, it is a mindset change. And then the lifestyle comes along for the ride. So yeah. th those are a couple of pointers that I would have, That's you know, ex exercising, you know, doesn't have to be this big thing of, I have to go to the gym. I have to, you know, buy a membership here. I have to do this. You know what I mean? You know, we have the technology that, you know, if you look on YouTube, there are a ton of free 15 minute workouts. Yep. 10 minute workouts, 20 minute workouts, right? You know, the weather's beautiful. Go outside and just take a stroll. Anything is better than doing that. Yeah, that's great. You know, one thing I love is the, um, I don't have it on today. I just happen to wear a different watch today, but I usually have the, uh, my Garmin, which measures steps. You have Fitbit, you have other ones out there that measure steps. You know, they say 10,000 is a good goal every day. Take the stairs, not the elevator. I mean, these are very fundamental things, but I'll tell you the biggest thing that I've seen with clients and friends or myself, even like yep, when during COVID, when I said, I want to get back, get rid of the weight that I had gained, it's all measuring. Like I have the app. I use fat secret 
it's on its own. If you get it on, I have an Android. You can download it on your phone. I usually use the website because it has online journals. You can write what you eat. It's got a populated menu right in there. You know, before I'd walk into like Chipotle, I knew if I was going to eat this, that's like 1200 calories. Can I really afford that? You know, that mix of fat, protein, carbohydrates, right? So, but the measurability, and I always say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I don't care if it's in sales, marketing, your weight, your emotional state of mind, your kids, you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So that's one of my big ones is if you're really serious, you just want to challenge yourself, just track everything, go crazy with the, the, the apps are amazing. You said uh, Fitbit, is that what you use? Yeah, I'm using Fitbit. Um, I haven't, I haven't been, I haven't had it on. I, I have it charging because I've been boxing a lot. Yeah. So what I was doing is I was wrapping it under my wraps. And, um, and so, because I like tracking my heart rate. Yeah. You know? And then, um, you know, it's, it's just was uncomfortable and it was actually starting to hurt because it was pinching. Yeah. And so I just haven't been wearing it the last couple of days, but yeah, I rocked the Fitbit. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to switch to the Apple watch because, you know, I think it's just, you know, a better move, but I'm also a competitor, man. So when my coworkers start challenging me to the work week hustles, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm winning uh, this one. Oh, that's and, good, man. And that's I good. haven't won one because I'm like, when do you, you know, do you have that thing? Did you tie it to a hamster and just put them on a wheel? Like, what do you yeah, do? Yeah, yeah, that's good. You know? So, um, I, yeah. so I had a couple, uh, it's funny how technology is. People can chat here, but then I get text messages. So I keep an eye on these. So question was, um, any books, any, any readings that you want to share? Anything that might help people with, if they're thinking about weight loss or anything that's helped you or inspired you in any way, any readings? I think the four agreements is a wonderful book. Great book. Great book. Um, right back here. The four what? agreements. Yeah. Um, I would, I would recommend that, um, I'm, I'm chipping away slowly because I just started teaching summer school, um, but I'm chipping away slowly at outwitting the devil. Love it. Yeah. Love yeah. You know, and that's just, that's more like, you know, positive mindset. You know, I think that, you know, again, there are no silver bullets. I mean, you, you can, you can read the entire library. Yeah. You know? um, I think that really, you know, get the mind right. And the body comes along for the ride. Yeah, it's so true. One of the books I'm reading right now is uh, recommended to me last year. And I had just because COVID, I had so many books I was reading at one time is um, Ego is the Enemy. Mm. Great book. Another one is Positive Psychology. Great book. Um, Seligman, if you read anything by Seligman, Professor Seligman, S-E-L-I-G-M-A-N. So he's the original founder in 1998 of Positive Psychology. So he's a therapist by design, but he was so frustrated in the 90s when he proclaimed to the industry, like, why are we spending so much time focused on the negative? Like we're studying all, the, spending all this money focusing on depression, suicide. Why don't we thought, focus on the opposite and say, well, why is this guy so happy? Why is this dude so happy? Like, let's focus on that. So he did a major paradigm shift in the world of therapy and counseling in 98 and it's positive psychology. He's got a whole institute dedicated to it. Those are the two that I'm reading right now. I love it. And it, it, it's just, it goes back to this, John right? It's between the ears, brother. You can sit there and you can follow the program and you can step on the scale and you can do the killer workout. You can follow the macros, but yeah. if the mind is not right, the, everything else is going to fall behind, man. And one thing I want to say too, um, because I have to get this in here is, you know, I have a voice, right? I have a voice and I've lost the weight. I'm working hard to keep the weight off. And I was talking to my wife about this the other day. It's like, I want to use this voice to bring awareness to diabetes, you know, yeah. my father, my father was a diabetic my entire life. Um, you know, I watched him on dialysis in the last years of his life, you know, and it really took a lot out of him. He didn't want a kidney. I offered him a kidney. A lot of people offered him kidneys. He said, nah, you guys keep your kidneys. I've lived a good full life. I'm just going to ride out dialysis and, you know, and until the wheels fall off, essentially, you know, my uncle Ernie fell into a diabetic coma. He never even knew he was a diabetic. He never went to the doctor, just tough as nails, like old Mexican American guy, you know, and, you know, drank every day, you know, and it caught up to him and he fell into a diabetic coma and he ended up not making it, you know, diabetes is, is the, is a huge killer in the Latino community and in the African American community. I mean, communities of color are disproportionately affected by this. We also have to take into consideration food deserts. 
you know, the systemic inequalities, you know, shopping at Whole Foods versus, you know, in what neighborhoods do the dollar menu McDonald's ads run on the city buses? And I was talking about this the other day, show me a Whole Foods with a McDonald's within a one block proximity. You're not going to find it. So that's not by accident, you know, and a lot of lower income families and lower income families of color opt for the dollar menu. You know, a single mom who has a bunch of kids, it's more cost effective and easier to grab $10 worth of McDonald's and feed the kids, right? Rather than come home from a hard day's work and prepare a meal for that many people and then clean up, you know? I mean, so I don't want that lost in the conversation. So I wanna use my voice to bring awareness to these issues, right? And to show it's possible. Because when you think about, you know, how we eat in the Mexican community and in the Latino community, not you need to make, but I'm half Mexican. So, you know, you go to a Mexican restaurant, you're starting off with chips and salsa. Okay, deep fried carbohydrates. You order a chili verde plate. Okay, half of that is rice and refried beans with a slab of cheese on top of it, fried in lard and pork, and then tortillas on top of that. Then you're having either a soda, so maybe a a, an iced tea, or beer, or a margarita. And then you might have flan or you know, arroz con leche for dessert or churros. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just carbs stacked on carbs, stacked on carbs and mm -hmm. grease and lard. I mean, it's just like super unhealthy. You know what I mean? And, you know, and, and that's, that's a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so I don't want that to be lost on the conversation. And I'm gonna, I'm committed to using my voice to bring awareness to it. I love it. So, hey, we're, we're going to wrap up here. We're coming up on the hour. Can you tell us where to get you on uh, your handles, IG, uh, social media? What, what's your preferential way for people to reach out to you? Because this, this is obviously recorded. We're going to share this around on social. You know, if, if my numbers play out, you know, several thousand people are going to see this in the next couple of days when we share it around. So right. I know it's going to touch someone. It's going to inspire. I always say if you can touch them, you can move them and you can inspire them. TMI, TMI, to touch, move, inspire. So you already touched the mood and inspired me, man, just by what you've done and showing me those pictures from the last couple of months and just being my friend all these years and being just authentic and being a bro. But the, beyond our friendship, I know the people in my, in my database and the people that are going to see this are going to be inspired some way. So what, what, what's the best way to catch up? The best way to get me is on Instagram at the after knife. Okay. The after knife. Um, I don't know if you want to put it in the chat, Mike. Um, and I started that page as a page of accountability, almost as like a diary for my food intake. You're going to see a lot of pictures of the breakfast that I eat every day. I eat the same breakfast every day because I'm putting gas in the tank Yep. and, um, and it's delicious. Um, so the after knife, I will, it's, it's done. It's, no, it's done. Not V right. One E T H E T H E after knife. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so, and so, you know, um, it's all things bariatric related lifestyle exercise musings, you know, um, reflections. It's basically like, you know, my, my journal and my food diary and my exercise diary, just basically, you know, that congruency, right. Mm -hmm. Walking the talk. Yep. So that's why that's there for accountability. Cause if you're okay. going to say it, you better do it. I love it, man. I love it. Well, brother, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know you're a busy guy and it's summer months, so you got family time, but uh, to take this time, you know, I always look at one hour as investment. It's a one hour investment of time to watch this, listen to it and listen to be inspired. I, I guarantee you every single person has someone, someone in their life that's that's struggling or going through something around weight loss, whether it's extreme or not, but it's, it's, it's helping just change the narrative, change that mindset, the way you speak to yourself around food, and buddy, I, I appreciate it. any, any parting thoughts, man. Yeah, man. I just want to say that, you know, one, one quick childhood memory. I remember calling you on the phone and your dad, not letting me talk to you because you were taking your cuts. You know, oh, yeah, Mike, yeah. Was, Mike was a fantastic baseball player and he didn't get there alone. His dad really, really dialed him in. And, you know, that takes a certain level of discipline. 
And it wasn't just swing the bat a hundred or a thousand times. It was perfect cuts, right? To develop that muscle memory. And this is no different. Here we are, you know, you know, 30, 35 years later, you know, from that era. And really, you know, this is taking our cuts. We're just doing it in a different way. Wow. You know, we, this requires discipline. It requires a disciplined mind. Iron sharpens iron, man. So I'm excited to be here with you. I just want to say thank you to the opportunity for the opportunity to be here. And hopefully, you know, uh, we reach some people with this and uh, a lot of good comes out of this. So I just want to say thank you and to everybody out there who's tuning in. Thank you, brother. I'll have this thing rendered and up on YouTube in the next 24 hours so people can share it around on YouTube. So uh, Chris and uh, Richard, all the guys out there, you made some comments. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. These are some of our old school friends. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll be sharing. So that's it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat here soon, bro. Take care. I love you, man. Love you too, bro. Thanks much. Yeah, man. Take care. Bye-bye.